All right, are we ready? You can hear me? All right. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Kai Sturman, uh, one of the emergency physicians at Stony Brook Eastern Long Island Hospital. Uh, my thanks to Peconic Landing for inviting me here. Thank you to Anna for uh, setting this all up. Uh, appreciate the hospitality. Um, I think there are a few other folks that are joining us uh, via Zoom, uh, virtually electronically. So I welcome those people as well. Uh, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started, all right? Uh, so I'm gonna spend maybe the next hour or so, maybe a little bit less than that, uh, discussing various things in summer safety. And I encourage your participation in this discussion. Certainly if you have questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Uh, I've been practicing emergency medicine for quite a while. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you how many years that would kind of give away how old I am. But let's say I've been out here in Greenport working full time at Eli for more than a decade now. And uh, I've seen some things uh, during the summer and all year long. And uh, some of those things have taught me, uh, taught me some lessons about emergency medicine. I think there are lessons uh, that we can all learn from and things that I've seen and unfortunately things that I see repeatedly. So we'll discuss some of those and see how we can maybe uh, avoid them. So what are we gonna do? Um, this is a large topic and I'm gonna go over a number of things. I'm gonna go over some concepts. I'm gonna go over some examples. Uh, I've tried to categorize things as best as I could. That's not always easy to do. So it might seem like we're skipping back and forth but the overarching umbrella is summer safety. Uh, by and large, this is illness and injury prevention. That's really what we're talking about. We're talking illness and injury prevention, uh, specifically with things that relate to summer or things that we see more frequently during the summer months. Our broad base and basic concepts. Uh, and as I've already said, if you have questions, we can discuss these things all the better. Uh, my only request is if you do learn something and if you hear something for the first time or some light bulb goes off in your head and you say to yourself, I never thought of that. Well then please share it with friends, share it with family so that the lesson can, uh, can go on. So where are we? We are uh, up here. So let me just make sure I get this right. That's okay. We're up in here in Greenport, right? So we have the North Fork, the South Fork. We have Shelter Island. Robbins Island, we don't get to go there. That's private, Gardner's is private. But anyway, what we have here is we have bays, beautiful bays. We have Long Island Sound. We have my personal favorite, the Atlantic Ocean down here. Lots of stuff that we can do and enjoy ourselves. Lots of places to get in trouble. And of course we have the, we have the North Fork, the land mass itself, right? And all around here are fields, streams, golf courses, meadows, all sorts of places to play and uh, all sorts of places that we could get in trouble if we don't watch what we're doing. So the tail of the fish, we just went over that. Uh, fields, beaches, roads, trails, sand. We have various devices to enjoy all of these places. We'll go over some of those. And we have, this is kind of important here, unfamiliar houses, okay? I realize that I am speaking to a somewhat narrow audience age-wise, but I imagine many, of you have visitors and those visitors might be family, different generations of family members and they come out. And whether you're invited to someone else's house or you are, you invite your family members over. Unfamiliar houses, uh, we're gonna talk about those because that in itself can be a problem. Uh, we have, whoops, we have uh, exotic foods or we have great foods here, right? We have fresh food. Uh, we have healthy food, and we'll talk a little bit about food safety. Not much to talk about there because all of our places here, they practice food safety, and, and the food is just delicious. And sorry, I'm clicking the wrong buttons here. And then we have libations. I'm going to uh, define that somewhat broadly and perhaps go over some things that you didn't expect to hear uh, in this talk. And then, of course, it is the summer. Uh, we have heat, right? And heat can really spell trouble for us. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to uh, mitigate any kind of heat problems. Um, all right. So now the, the main thing here, as I said, illness, injury, prevention, and concepts. Okay. Uh, and, and one of the concepts we're going to go over repeatedly is situational awareness. Another concept is, yeah, you, know, you have to be mindful and to some extent, we're in this 
sort of, uh, well, this won't happen to me, right? I mean, you hear about people getting struck by lightning. That doesn't happen to us. It happens, it always happens to somebody else. Well, actually, none of those somebody else's thought it could happen or would happen to them. So just again, be mindful. Bad stuff happens to good people. And if you're at least aware of that, that will help you to avoid it if you can. Uh, so one of the categories I'll talk about now, if we're talking uh, land-based stuff, whether it's trails, roads, et cetera, let's just broadly categorize it as things with wheels. This is Long Island. People drive everywhere because our mass transportation is really bad. Uh, and there is problem with distracted driving. And um, no, nobody here needs to be reminded that, you know, people with one hand on these and two eyes on this and one eye on the road, it's just not good. So they're distracted driving from uh, devices, meaning telephones. Oh, wrong subject, wrong button again. Uh, and substances. Uh, of course, we all know about alcohol and uh, DWIs and distracted driving. Uh, impaired driving. Unfortunately, there are other drugs beyond alcohol that can spell trouble. Uh, you have to be aware that other people might be using them. Uh, and then even simple conversations, if there are too many people in the car or somebody in the back's talking, the driver's going like this to participate, not good. So even if you're a passenger in the car, be mindful that you're not taking attention away from the driver. Now, Finding your way can be a distraction, certainly. And there are lots of people driving in the North Fork that really haven't been here before and they don't really know what they're looking for. There may be a left turn, maybe a right turn. They're looking down at their GPS. They're looking at their friend's handwritten instructions. Um, it's a bit of a problem. Be nice to the people that are searching for the right way to go. You don't know which way they're gonna suddenly hook a turn. And if you're, giving, uh, if you're giving directions to a family member, be clear with those directions so that uh, they're not confused when they're sitting behind the wheel and moving forward. Um, the pilot and the navigator, it's sort of the way my wife and I get around anywhere. Uh, either she drives and I navigate or vice versa. It works out really well. So rather than one person trying to find their way and figure out where they're going at the same time, try to divide those tasks if you can. And then of course, um, as long as we're talking about automobiles, there's Uber, Lyft, all of the ride share services. Um, I use Uber very frequently. It, it's, it's easy, it's not inexpensive, but it's accessible, it's easy. Uh, and just consider the fact that it's there and uh, use that service if it would be helpful in terms of uh, preventing any kind of issues. All right, we're gonna go on, we're gonna leave wheels for a second. We'll talk about other wheels in a little while, but one of the things I mentioned in the first slide is unfamiliar houses. And this is something that we see all too frequently. This is something we see more commonly in the summer months because the, the number and the type of visitors tend to increase in the summer months and more of them that come out here in the winter time. But you got four doors or two doors or three doors and they kind of look the same. Is one the bathroom? Maybe, or maybe it's the basement stairs. And if it's dark and it's the middle of the night and the person doesn't know the house they're in, that's a real problem potentially. I've seen devastating injuries that way. So I suggest that if you have a home, you're visiting someone's home, and there's a door they really shouldn't be walking through, whether that's a dive down into the basement or you're upstairs, down the stairs, what have you, put a bar across it. Not just a little sign that says don't open this, either lock it definitively or put a bar across it. Uh, I, I, I've seen all too many bad things happen that way. Um, so uh, making your home or, or a rented home safe for others and with that too, especially with Airbnb and, and Verbo, whether or not they're used here much in the community. Uh, people sometimes rent homes, not for themselves, but you might rent a home for your family member. Uh, same kind of deal. Do an orientation tour in the daylight, put the lights on, walk all around the place, know which door is where, uh, make sure that there's adequate lighting at night. Yes, I know we want to uh, conserve energy, but if there are unfamiliar surroundings, unfamiliar people in the house, leave a hallway light on. Uh, it, it's very, very helpful. We talked about basement stairs. 
dangerous substances also very important, right? And this is, you know, we, we, we've all sort of been through life to a certain extent. Uh, if you've had younger ones in your life, you know, child-proof your home, uh, a very basic concept. So all medications should be locked up. Lots of reasons to do that, not just for the little ones that might get their hands into the wrong jar, but medication should be out of sight and inaccessible. And then there's a whole list of other things as cleaning agents, if you talk about the kitchen or the, or the, or the bathroom, but the garage might have all sorts of toxic things. Uh, just make sure they're out of reach and, and that everything's properly labeled. Uh, sloping driveways, inclines. I mentioned this only because uh, something you wouldn't likely think about. And it was a horrible accident on the South Fork. I'm going to guess somewhere about five or 10 years ago where family came out uh, from the city, uh, friend's home. Uh, they set themselves up. Gentleman parked in the driveway, started unloading the car. And uh, the little girl climbed into the little red wagon and the little red wagon took off on its own down the driveway into the roadway in front and the poor girl was killed by a passing car. Not the kind of thing that you would think about, but you have to think about it, right? So think about those kinds of things. If the driveway slopes, make sure nothing is gonna roll down there, particularly if, you, if, if there's a person on board. Uh, all right, uh, next, uh, let's talk about uh, fields, beaches, golf courses, uh, uneven surfaces. So I, um, I just came back from Charleston, actually, I was there yesterday. And one of the things we were told ahead of time, we were told several times while we were there, uh, Charleston's a beautiful city. Anyone been? Uh, raise your hands, all right, just one. A beautiful city, a beautiful old city. And, and part of the appeal is that it's, retains its character. That means the hand laid bricks, the stones, they're uneven. And you literally, you can't just watch where you're walking in front of you, you have to walk like this. And in fact, the, the college students there, they say, they, yeah, like when you first get there, people trip all the time and they call it the Charleston shuffle, which is kind of funny, but if you go down hard, it's not funny because you can break a wrist, you can break things. So what I'm saying is here, parking lots, curbs, what have you, nothing is a perfect and even surface as I'm sure it is here in Peconic Landing where they pay a great deal of attention to this. But if you're walking in town, if you're stepping out of the car to go to a restaurant, you're on a dock, just be very mindful about what's in front of you and keep an eye on your family and your friends and make sure that they're, they're aware and looking also. Um, all right, insects and arachnids. We're going to talk a little bit more about those later. Uh, so I think I'll leave that for now. Uh, okay, sun. This is fairly straightforward where the sun comes to heat. But if we're talking sun damage and protection to your skin, um, you really want to be protected all the time, uh, even on cloudy days. This is stuff you've heard time and time again, probably all too many times, but you really can't overdo it. Uh, the sunscreens now, they're so great that you can get them in spray version, and it's just so easy to put on. I recommend 50 or above. There are all sorts of varieties from waterproof to sportproof to scent to non scent, to whatever, ha whatever you have, use sunblock when you're outdoors. And I think I have a slide in this coming up. The clothing is uh, is really gotten great. Like, like many other things in technology, you know, life has improved for all of us. Uh, so uh, the clothing rash guards in particular, I want to talk about just as a fun fact. So uh, how many of you have heard the term rash guard? Okay, you've heard that. You know where it came from? That... Well, uh, okay, I'm going to have a different version. You might be right, but I, I, I think I might have a different answer. But in any event, ra rash guard is like a ubiquitous term for a, a purpose made sunblock clothing. They're usually made out of synthetic fibers. Now they're very, very light. You don't even know that you're wearing them. They dry off super quickly. So rash guard, my version of the entomology for that term is uh, it's a surfing term. And if you're on a surfboard and you're paddling to get your wave and you're out there for hours at a time on this waxy surfboard deck, uh, which usually has collect sand in it and the sand sticks to the wax and you're basically 
swimming on sandpaper for hours on end. And what that does to your chest and your nipples, frankly, it creates a rash. So the rash guard is to have a protective barrier between you and the surfboard. But rash guards are really there for sun protection. So here I think is an example, that's JJ, John John Florence representing the USA in the Olympic games last, uh, last time, excellent surfer and sailor. Uh, he's wearing one of his own creations, um, Florence Marine X. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I, I have no interest in any of these things. There are lots of different brands, but what I just wanted to point out, so, you know, long sleeve, loose fitting, uh, the thing around his neck is actually a hood. He can pull it up over his head. So you have great sun protection. You don't even know that you're wearing it. Kids kind of love it. Comes with all sorts of cool graphics. So just something to think about for sun protection. All right, uh, on to the next subject. We've covered sun. We're going to go into heat. Anyone recognize this gentleman? I wouldn't, by the way. I'm just truthful disclosure. Well, he is uh, Pope John Paul. And I uh, just want to illustrate something uh, with respect to heat. So Pope John Paul uh, came to New York uh, back in the 1990s sometime, and he gave mass at Aqueduct Raceway. And it was in mid-October, but it was incredibly warm that day. And so you think we only have heat waves now with global warming, but this was an unexpected, severe severely hot day. And even though it was 1990s, way before 9-11, it was the Pope. And there were serious security measures in force. No umbrellas allowed, no water bottles allowed, which is kind of obscene almost. You have all these, the, the, um, the audience, if you will, uh, sitting outside in an uncovered stadium. And many of those folks were you know, our age or older. And I worked medical tent, uh, one of them uh, during that visit. And we just had people coming in one after the other that just literally boom, 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 drop from heat, what we call heat related syncope. Now, if that happens out here, and it does happen out here frequently, golf courses are often to blame. We talk about some other, uh, uh, some other contributing factors. But when that happens, we come to our emergency department. Well, then, you know, we go through this, have to go through this long differential diagnosis of considering what may have made this person faint. The obvious answer is the heat and dehydration, but there could be other, th other things as well. So in the emergency department, that now sets you up for a three or four hour stay at minimum with thousands of dollars worth of investigative testing where what I found really interesting, somewhat refreshing, frankly, in Aqueduct is we just had we just had stretchers and we had IV bags and we just gave them bottle, you know, IV fluids, saline and a liter, maybe two liters, wake up, they'd be fine, and they go back and listen to the to the rest of the mass. Uh, but but my point being, it was basically they were in a situation where they couldn't be adequately prepared for the heat. There was nothing to block the sun. There was no way to stay hydrated. Uh, so the, the importance here is shade and hydration. And we'll, we'll talk about both of those as well. All right, so that was John Paul. Uh, all right, hydration, water. Um, I'll mention what I thought was a somewhat, um, trying to make a point here, somewhat, uh, I thought humorous at the time situation. So um, I spent some time in Mexico. I lived there for a couple of years and uh, coming across the border, uh, we were, I don't know, I was with some friends, we were thirsty, stayed in a motel. And I asked the gentleman, uh, the owner, who happened to be a German American with a very heavy accent. And I just asked him if it was all right for me to drink the water. And he just looked at me and this is really in every positive way, nothing to say negative about South of the border. He just said in the thickest German action, son, you are in America, like you can drink the water. And my point here is we can all drink the water. We don't need to go to the store to buy water or to buy a Gatorade or a hydration solution. Water works just fine for almost all of us. If you don't like the taste and you want to get something fancy, by all means, that's okay. But I would just say, get a reusable bottle, fill it with tap water, and use it to drink. Medically speaking, it's every bit as effective 
as the electrolyte solutions that you see. Unless you're an endurance athlete, you don't need anything other than water on a regular basis. So, all right, so we covered water, sports drinks, uh, plan ahead, which means if you're out and away from your home uh, and you're, let's say, away from a store or 7-Eleven, well, bring some water with you. Don't let yourself be found in a place where you have no access to water when you need it. So plan ahead and drink ahead too. Don't just wait till you're thirsty and really parched before you drink. Uh, coffee, tea, and soda, you know, the, the, the common sort of uh, assumption is coffee, tea, uh, they dehydrate uh, maybe a little bit. Yeah, they'll make you pee a little bit more, but your net intake is still better than your, your net output. So uh, there's no reason to stay away from coffee and tea, but if you're drinking a lot of coffee and tea, I suggest you drink some water as well. Uh, soda's not great for your health, no matter which way you cut it. And then lastly, alcohol. Yes, alcohol will dehydrate you. Uh, I don't have many good things to say about alcohol from a medical perspective, but again, be mindful. Alcohol and heat very definitely uh, don't mix. All right, back to uh, things with wheels, other things with wheels, motorcycles, bicycles, skateboards, um, or the rented equipment we'll talk about and uh, knowing how to stop, we'll talk about that too. Uh, so these all have something in common, more or less. One, they're rolling over hard surface. So if you fall on that hard surface, it's going to hurt and maybe do some damage. Uh, once you get any kind of speed going, you can hit stationary objects, you can hit other moving objects, you just want to be careful. Uh, if it's borrowed or rented equipment, uh, as often as the case out here, take the time to adjust it properly to the user. Uh, bike, the obvious thing is adjust the saddle up and down. Uh, there may be other adjustments depending on what it is that you're riding, but make sure that the user is comfortable with the equipment and that it's suitably sized. Uh, know how to stop. So back when, uh, you know, before I wrote this talk and before I, uh, before I was as mindful as I am now, uh, I was out here actually visiting back then Kutchok a uh, friend of mine, beautiful home on Pequash. And I went out for a stroll in my rollerblades and it was, a, it was a great time. It was a great Saturday afternoon. I was cruising all around the place. They're brand new rollerblades. I'd never used them before. Skated all my life, that's not a big deal, but mostly ice skates. And I wasn't really that familiar with the rollerblades, but no problem. I was cranking along, had my helmet on and I came to a street and uh, it went downhill. So yeah, this is, should be kind of fun. And I got into like a little bit of a talk and I'm rolling along faster and faster and faster. I'm like, okay, eventually it's got to level out. And then I see a stop sign in front of me and I realized that actually this was Pequash just going straight ahead. And then I see a car go by. I'm like, holy jeez, I got to stop. And I, I, did, I know how to stop on ice skates. I can stop on a dime on ice skates. I don't know what to do with these wheels. I really didn't. So I actually dove into the woods. I found a space between trees with lots of needles and I was fine. But my point is, you know, I, I should have been smarter. I should have thought about this ahead of time. Uh, so if you're, if you're on inclines, know how to stop. Uh, all right, and here is, uh, this is uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine, shall we say, with a mutual interest in motorcycles, riding one of his vintage BMWs. Uh, David Lee, and I was uh, down visiting him in the shop in Charleston uh, on another visit. And yeah, we just talked about motorcycles and safety. And what he said is, uh, I'll go on to the next slide, I think. Yeah. Uh, so what he said is basically the thing up front. This personal situation is out to get me. That's how he approaches life on a motorcycle. And you know, it's an interesting concept in a way, and I will uh, admit to you that very early in my training, somewhere between being a medical student and uh, graduating from residency, I had a senior resident who was really sharp guy. He was a great doctor, I'll say that. And he just, as part of his thing for the junior people, he said, Kai, so you can go see this patient, ask yourself this question. How can this go wrong? How can this go wrong for you and for the patient? Figure out all the things that could possibly go wrong and you'll take good care of the patient. I thought that was rather cynical and to a degree, I'm sure it was sure the cynicism, but it actually kind of works. If you, if you think of, you know, you're riding a motorcycle or you're, you're on a scooter and you see things in front of you, just assume that that person is out to get you 
and they're not going to be able to hit you. That's the, the, the David Lee philosophy behind riding a motorcycle, and he says it really works for him. Keep your eyes moving. There are other vehicles, pedestrians, road trail hazards. Uh, all of that stuff is pretty obvious. Uh, now protective gear. All right, this is really important, and, and we're not just talking motorcycles here. Uh, we're talking all the other stuff too, rollerblades, uh, um, skateboards, uh, et cetera. Uh, I will say, and I say this to my patients all the time, I say this to virtually every single patient that I see with a head injury, uh, that I would not be here enjoying this moment, but for a helmet that saved my life. And, th and that is the honest truth. I went different incidents from peak wash. I went down hard on rollerblades and struck my head into a concrete corner. And yeah, I didn't think that would happen to me because like I knew how to skate. So uh, again, one, it can happen to you and two, I had a helmet on, but for that helmet, I would not be there. There's no, I would not be here. There's no question in my mind about that. So I strongly believe in helmets, I encourage everyone to use helmets if they're on wheels and rolling. Uh, better, uh, better fit, better look. Um, there are um, use specific helmets, right? Every sport has its own sort of thing. You know, if you play golf, you have to wear certain shoes. They have to be different shoes from if you're playing tennis. Not sure why. The helmet thing too. I mean, yes, you can get bike helmets. You can get motorcycle helmets. You can get a uh, skateboard helmet. It, you know, it doesn't really matter if you have a helmet that fits well. And uh, if you're, if the person's likely to wear it, that's the best kind of helmet. Uh, and then, uh, so better fit, better looks, more likely to be used. Wrist, elbow, knee guards, whatever, uh, whatever you think might be helpful. Uh, abrasion resistant clothing, we already talked about that a little bit. And sunglasses are really important, right? And uh, especially my daughter who recently got her driver's license, I tell her all the time, you know, when that sun goes low, you can't see a thing without sunglasses. Make sure you have sunglasses so you can see what's coming at you. All right, uh, any questions about any of that before we go to the next uh, or any comments? No. Nope. Okay, next the subject, this would be things that float. So I think we've covered things with wheels, we've covered land. So now on to things that float, whether we're talking bays or oceans or swimming pools. Uh, so that encompasses uh, kayaks, paddle boards, surfboards, wakeboards and water skis, boats and pool floaties. Uh, let me say a few things about pools here because there's actually not much in this talk about swimming pools. And that's kind of a shame. I probably should have put a couple of slides in there. So pools are really dangerous. And uh, if you, you know, it, it, there's no summer that goes by where you don't hear of at least a couple of local cases of young kids drowning in a pool. And that's really, really sad. The last one that I knew was just a couple of weeks ago. I was working. I heard it on the EMS radio. The uh, EMS crew was on a on a call up island. Uh, somebody that had been found in a pool. So pools are really, really dangerous for young kids. Uh, so what can you do? Uh, there are pretty strict fence laws, uh, I think on all of Long Island and Suffolk County. So every pool should have a fence that would prevent uh, a stranger or a kid from walking into the pool when it shouldn't be there. But what, what you have to be careful of also is, is parties, right? Parties, cookouts, barbecues. Um, kids are gonna be running around and it's a, you know, I've, I've had, oh, I, I have, children and uh, I live on the water and they were really little. It's a scary time. You have to be hyper vigilant. You should assign someone the task of physically keeping an eye on the toddler. Life jackets are not a bad idea, but make sure somebody is watching and talk back and forth. We're going to talk a little bit more about communication because what frequently happens in cases like this is I thought you were watching. No, I, I thought you were watching. So it has to be dialogue between people who is watching the pool or who's watching a particular toddler. Uh, on that note, uh, uh, my son and my niece are both ocean lifeguards. Uh, I believe in lifeguards. Uh, even if you, if there's a pool party, you know, just think about the concept of hiring a lifeguard for the party. I know my son did a fair amount of work back in his day uh, covering you know, high school parties and the like. It's always good to have somebody there uh, professionally keeping an eye on things. So that I think that's all I'm going to say about pools, but I, I can't overemphasize the importance. All right, so uh, protective gear here, uh, sort of the helmet analogy or, or not, you know, not, for, not for things that roll, but things that float, uh, life jacket. 
Uh, there are some life jacket laws in New York. It clearly, you have to have enough uh, life jackets on the boat for every occupant in the boat. Uh, occupants in the boat, I believe, after November 1st or, or November 15th in New York State, actually have to wear the life jacket, which I think is a, a good rule, not in summertime. But uh, anytime some, and I make this my own personal practice, if I go on a boat alone, I doesn't matter which boat, how safe I feel or don't feel, I put a life jacket on because it something happens, I go out of the boat, there's nobody around to pull me back in. So if I'm alone, I put a life jacket on. Should be no shame in wearing a life jacket, the more the better. Uh, they are they're, they're available as inflatable life jackets, wearable inflatables, strap along inflatables, uh, all sorts of stuff. There's no excuse for not having uh, the right equipment for somebody who's going to use it. Uh, a leash is uh, a cord between the surfboard and, a, uh, and, and the and the surfer, I guess. Lots of uh, stand-up paddle boards uh, going on, right? Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a, a, a growing water sport, something that, that I embrace myself. So if you fall off the board and it's windy, that wind can actually push that board away from you very quickly. So uh, a leash purpose-made, one end attaches to the board, the other attaches to your ankle. That's a good idea. Footwear uh, to keep you from uh, bruising your your feet, the footwear is a good idea. Also, if you're walking around in shallow water, all sorts of stuff, you don't know what you're stepping on. So water shoes and some version thereof are always a good idea. Uh, Coast, Guard, Coast Guard requirements, uh, there, there's a list that depends on the size of the vessel. Uh, most of the time, if you buy a boat, it comes with all the stuff in it. But when you think about it, this, I'm, I'm not a big fan of over-regulation, but I don't consider this over-regulation. Anything that's on that list that you're supposed to have in a boat is a really good idea and you shouldn't leave, shouldn't leave the dock without it. Sunglasses come up again, even more so on the water, the uh, sun tends to be more blinding. And then your buddy, and I think that's getting us into the next slide here, hopefully, if I remember correctly, all right. Uh, somebody recognized the Pope or a Pope. Anybody recognize this guy? He was one of my heroes back in the day. Go ahead. Oh, Liam Nielsen? No, no, think back. Television series. Yes, Sea Hunt. Mike Nelson. So one, Mike Nelson, uh, Roy Bridges, the the father to uh, Bo and Jeff Bridges. Uh, so anyway, I was just fascinated with the show when I was a kid. Uh, so I bring this up only because the first time that I ever heard the term buddy system was when I took a diving course a bunch of time back, and the buddy said, "Never dive alone." And even if you're in a big group, you got you and your buddy. And you know, you never lose sight of each other. You always support each other, the buddy system. So to me, the buddy system is synonymous with scuba diving, which is why Mike Nelson is up there. But uh, apparently the entomology of that term is different. It's, it's out of the military, about the same time the scuba was developed back in the 1940s. But in any event, uh, and ironically, of course, I put him up here as the poster child for the buddy system, but Mike Nelson never dove with the buddy. He always dove alone and he always got in some kind of trouble because of it. All right, uh, so concept of the buddy system. I did ask uh, a couple of people that uh, younger than I am uh, that are actively involved in sports in the summer community here uh, out in the East End uh, and two individuals in particular. Uh, and I asked them, I said, you guys spend, you know, basically all summer outside doing crazy things on boats, on paddle boards, on bicycles, you know, talk to me about what, what do you think is important when I'm going to give this presentation at Peconic Landing? And, um, uh, Drew Harvey, whose name isn't up there, wrote a really nice paragraph for me. It's all about communication. And these guys, just to give you some perspective, uh, uh, Drew and, and two friends rode from uh, Pacific Coast, Washington, the actual Pacific Coast, like the water, to Sag Harbor, like here, uh, in 30 days on a bicycle. That means they covered more than 100 miles a day for 30 days running. And they did that to raise some money to raise awareness for our un unfortunate public health crisis with opiate addiction and opiate overdoses. So in any event, his, uh, his lesson to me, passing on to use the buddy system, communication is the most important thing. So if you're, again, just as I said, with the party at the pool, make sure you're actually talking to people. Don't make an assumption that that person's going to do this and you're going to do that. Make sure it's agreed upon. 
Uh, so discuss plans for activity, uh, specific roles we talked about, make contingency plans if something doesn't uh, go the way you expect. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's it for the buddy system. I've exhausted that one, I think. Uh, all right, there they are on their way. Uh, I don't know where this was, but it was somewhere between Washington and Sac Harbor taking a break. Uh, all right, if you're going to go alone, and uh, I spent time out on the water alone, that's okay. Uh, if you're going to go alone or a family member is going to go somewhere alone, whether that's out on the water or whether that's out in a field or, or, or a, uh, a trail, uh, make a, you know, the, the airline pilots uh, work this out with a, by virtue of a flight plan. Professional pilots are required to file a flight, flight plan, which basically is a sort of a written uh, communication so that if you don't show up where you're supposed to be or where you're expected, people will know at least where to start looking for you. So the, uh, the, the boat people have taken this and called it a float plan. If you're going out on the water, let people know where you intend to go and in what time. And the same thing if you're going on trails uh, and, and you're by yourself, or even if you're in a small group, let somebody else know where the group is headed. Uh, specific is good, but the, you know, general at least is better than nothing. Include a timeline where you expect to be when, uh, and then consider sharing your location on Friend Finder. And this is something you may not all be familiar with uh, to our kids. Of course, it's all second nature. But uh, if you have a, a smartphone, certainly an iPhone, Android, do the same thing. You can allow people to track where you are. So that uh, sometimes like if uh, my wife is on her way home from work and I wanna know when to put the kettle on for her tea, uh, I'll just look and see, you know, is she 10 minutes from home or 20 minutes from home? You could do that. And it's really great for uh, stuff like if you're doing adventure things or sports things, uh, it will help people track you if you're so inclined and then they can, they can find you. Uh, I generally don't, uh, you have to be mindful though, of course, there are lots of areas without cell phone service. So if you're in an area without cell phone service, that's not going to work. Uh, and I don't like to take my phone on the water with me. I go out in lots of small crafts. I use a paddleboard. I use a rolling shell. I never ever take my phone with me, but uh, there are small satellite tracking devices. They're surprisingly inexpensive, $100, $200. And uh, they will let somebody know where you are if you need to be found. Uh, update family when plans change. So if, you're, if your plans have changed, let somebody know. And then carry identification. This is, a, I think, a Coast Guard version here. There are other ones. Most of the marinas have them. It's an orange waterproof sticker. So if you have a kayak, a paddleboard, anything like that, throw one of these stickers on with your name and cell phone number. This way, if you're object is found, right? One of two things might happen. Uh, it might just blow off the dock during the storm and somebody will find it a day later and say, oh my God, somebody's missing. And all they need to do is call the phone number and that person can answer the phone from their living room and say, oh no, I lost my paddleboard. Thanks for calling. I'll, I'll come back and pick it up on Saturday where otherwise it might start a like multi-state manhunt looking for the poor person that fell off the board. So again, communication. Um, so that's important. Um, carry identification with you. If heaven forbid something happens and you're unable to communicate verbally, then having some communication on board will be very helpful to those looking to help you out. And then, as I said, clearly mark uh, kayak paddle boards, uh, et cetera. Uh, all right, uh, what else can we cover? Things that swing, uh, golf clubs, baseball bats, and I probably see more in our emergency room here, actually, we see more problems from fishing poles than we do from baseball bats and golf clubs, thankfully, because these two can really do a lot. Well, fishing balls can get you in a bad way too. But you know, if somebody uh, is not mindful of who's around them, or if there are younger kids near somebody taking practice swings with a golf, or golf club or a baseball bat, just be careful that nobody goes within that radius. Uh, fishing poles, well, it's not the pole that'll get you, it's the hook that's attached to the end of the line. And uh, we, we kind of, I don't know, it's one of the more enjoyable things to us that we do in the emergency department is taking out the fish hook. Uh, sometimes it's more of a challenge than you would think, but the patient always leaves uh, grateful for what you've done. So, but uh, unfortunately it's happened several times a week. So uh, be careful with fishing, with fish hooks, uh, try to stay out of the way, uh, right. 
All right, insect ticks. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with all of this stuff here, particularly the ticks. Uh, this is a separate lecture in and of itself. So we're not gonna do a deep dive into this at all. Uh, so th there, there's nuisance and there's danger, right? If you get bitten by a mosquito, usually not a big deal. Your skin itches for a while, you might get a wheel and eventually it gets better. That's a nuisance, that's not a danger. Uh, maybe if that mosquito is carrying West Nile virus or Eastern equine encephalitis, that is much more of a problem. Uh, you don't really get to know whether or not that's the case. Uh, spiders here are generally not a problem. Contrary to what I occasionally hear other people try to say, the local spiders here are not a big deal. We do not have tarantulas. We do not have black widow spiders other than people's pets maybe. Uh, and I'm told fairly definitively that we do not have brown recluse spiders. Uh, they can do a lot of damage, but I'm told there are none of them out here on Long Island. They're way upstate. Uh, and the brown recluse will cause a skin necrosis. Uh, it's, not a, it's, it's not really, um, it's not an allergic type of a reaction. It's not an illness like ticks carry. It, it basically starts eating your skin, the, the, the chemical that the, the brown recluse secretes, but uh, it, it is not a problem for this area. Now that doesn't mean you can't get a bite that gets infected or you can't get a bite of something that has a, where you can get an inflammatory reaction. Uh, mosquitoes, I think we talked about with, um, you know, with a couple of viral pathogens that they can carry. And then Hymenoptera make up, I think I have the next slide here. Uh, I did not uh, go through. Uh, Hymenoptera are basically uh, bees, wasps, and hornets. And uh, they all hurt. Uh, they can be worse than that. A single bite, unless the person is allergic, usually is not a problem. Uh, yes, it will be painful. Yes, it, the area will become red the area will become swollen. That does not in and of itself identify an allergic reaction, certainly not a systemic allergic reaction, and nor does it identify uh, an infection in that wound if it's, if it's uh, quick. If those things happen, uh, you know, one, you, again, prevention, you try to stay out of the way. If somebody does get stung, uh, put a cool compress on, it takes a Motrin and more than likely uh, you'd be fine. Uh, so the, the, the problem with the, the, the main, there really are no direct allergies to, let me get away from this slide here again for a while. If we're talking ticks uh, and we're talking allergies, I'm sure you, most of you have heard of this alpha gal, which is a, people that have this, whatever it is they get from the Lone Star tick, renders them allergic to red meats and can make them very sick if they eat red meats. But in and of itself, it's not an allergic reaction to the tick bite like you get from a hymenoptera sting for people that are allergic to bees. Um, so uh, allergies, bee, hornet, wasp allergies can be very, very serious. They can be life-threatening. Uh, so uh, you just need to try to recognize that when it happens. Fortunately, this here, this is a depiction of an EpiPen. Um, if you have relatives or friends or family that uh, come to visit or you're in the company of them and you learn that they, they have a history of severe allergies, there should be an EpiPen around. Uh, apparently a friend of my wife's just last week saved a person on an airplane. Uh, he was uh, good thinking on his part. Uh, somebody ate something, had nuts in it that they were allergic to and had a severe allergic reaction on board an airplane at 40,000 feet, did not have his EpiPen. So my wife's friend who's also a physician asked the flight attendant to page overhead. Is there anyone on the plane that has an EpiPen? Next thing you know, three EpiPens made their way down the aisleway and gave the EpiPen and the patient did okay. So uh, EpiPens are really important. And uh, again, encourage those that need them to have them on hand. And it wouldn't be a bad thing to have in your medicine cabinet, frankly, uh, not a bad idea at all if you get frequent visitors. Uh, foods, uh, nuts and seeds, you, know, you can be allergic to virtually anything. If there's a question about the allergy being uh, serious enough, by all means, come and see us in the emergency department. That's why we're there. Uh, jellyfish, I bring this up, you know, lots of jellyfish all summer long. We swim in them. Uh, I did have a friend, or I do have a friend who 
once upon a long while ago had a jellyfish thing in Great South Bay. And uh, it was serious enough that the doctor at the time said he would not have done well had he not gone. It was actually my mother that took him to the emergency department. I went back out on the boat, but we didn't know any better. We were kids. So, uh, it, it, so it can happen that you can get sick from a jellyfish thing. I don't think we have Portuguese man of wars here routinely, but again, just something to be aware of in case it happens. Yep. Yeah, so it's a good question in general, right? So I'm going to, I don't know. I'm going to guess that there are about two years, which is, which, which is what many medications are. And the, uh, the, the, the rule on expired medications, as best as we can have a rule, okay? It's not like expired food in a way that can sort of like, I don't know, at the very least give you gastrointestinal upset if it's gone off. Medications don't go off in the sense that they suddenly turn toxic. They become less effective. And the rule from what I hear, and this is from, um, what's the name of that uh, public? It's a pharmacy, uh, a, a great pharmacy organization. They basically say, generally speaking, medications will lose about 10% of their effectiveness in a year's time. So if you, let's say, had an EpiPen and it was out of date and it was five years old, okay, it's probably going to be 50% effective. That's better than 0% if you have nothing else. So, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, you know, I, I certainly keep them around. And sure, if they're expired, get yourself another one. That's not a bad idea, but don't necessarily throw them out. It might actually be coming useful. Uh, okay. All right, falls, uh, this is a big one. Uh, I you know, don't know what to, oh, I have the Chadwick rule to talk about, which might be helpful. Uh, so falls, um, we actually, believe it or not, see more falls uh, than in the summertime than we do in the wintertime. So you would think falls, especially in the winter, icy driveways, that kind of stuff, slippery surfaces, this should be part of the winter injury and illness prevention talk. We see a lot of the stuff in the summertime. And there's lots of reasons, but I already talked about unfamiliar houses, people in unfamiliar environments, uh, ladders. Uh, I, I have a strong rule, a strong belief that nobody in this room, except for Anna maybe in the back, should ever find themselves up on a ladder. There's nothing that important on a ladder that you can't get somebody else to do because we fall down, it's really bad. Uh, inclines and steps talked about that sloping driveway, uh, docks and boats. Uh, so boats move and bob up and down. Um, floating docks do the same, fixed docks don't, but there's that interface between the dock and the boat, right? And that, that space gets, depending on what kind of current, what kind of waves are bobbing up and down, that, that space goes back and forth. It's a really dangerous area. Your foot can go into that space. If it's a big boat and comes back against the dock and crush your foot, very serious. Somebody can misjudge the distance or what they thought was going to be a six inch gap when you're halfway in midair turns into a foot and a half gap. So unfortunately you see quite a few people falling off of boats, falling off of docks, trying to get into boats. It's something to be super careful of try to have somebody on the receiving end assist you, even if you're perfectly able-bodied and like to get around by yourself. Uh, no, nothing, no shame in having somebody on the dock grab your hand as you're coming out or uh, the other way around. Um, swimming pools, uh, the, the thing, the danger in swimming pools and falls is the, the edge of the swimming pool. Of course, if you fall, if, you, if it's a toddler, like I said already, heaven forbid, falls in and can't swim, that, that's devastating. But uh, lots of horseplay around pools, right? People put surfboards in them, boogie boards, they try to surf on them, board gets out from behind them, boom, crack, head on the edge of the pool, not good. So just something to be really mindful of. Now, I'm gonna go over the Chadwick rule, which came on a boat. So uh, I've been on boats most of all of my life. I like spending time with there. My good friend, John Chadwick, also, so my brother went on a cruise with us, went to Block Island on, on John Chadwick's sailboat, and my brother was a little trying to get around. So what, uh, what, what John said was, okay, here's what you do. You don't just, you don't just look for the handhold and take a step towards it. 
No. First, you grab the handhold, then you take your step on a boat. I thought that was really brilliant advice. I sort of share it with all of my patients if, we're, uh, if there's an issue with, with fall. So uh, grab onto something before you take that first, uh, before you take that first step. Uh, all right, yeah, so we'll, we'll move along. It's getting kind of late already. So uh, none of this is probably surprising, but it's worth emphasizing. So alcohol, uh, yep, we all like to have a good time. Many of us enjoy a glass of wine with dinner, a glass of beer, what have you. The North Fork is known for its craft beer and it's increasingly fine wine. That's all okay, but just realize that it can do certain things. Uh, effects are amplified by dehydration and heat. So not a good idea to uh, get it on in the heat wave in, in the sun. Uh, so adjust limits accordingly. Be mindful of the others around you. You can usually tell if someone's had too much to drink, try to cut them off, certainly try to take their keys. Uh, it mixes particularly poorly with swimming and driving. Uh, again, this is probably not news to you, but it bears emphasizing. Uh, then adults and minors, I, I say this, uh, you know, in terms of parties, uh, as I mentioned, I do have a, uh, a daughter, one of my daughters who just graduated high school and starting college in the fall. You know, no, she's not old enough to drink. She's only 18. That's not legal drinking age. Some of her friends are older. Uh, she has friends over. It's a, you know, it's a dangerous situation to be in. We like to have their friends with us as opposed to somewhere else. But be aware that 18, you know, somebody under 21 is not allowed to drink, period, end of story. And even you in your own house as an adult really are breaking the law if you provide alcohol to minors. That's just the way the law is. And you don't want to be on the wrong side of the law if, heaven forbid, something bad happens and somebody decides to take a drive while they're not able. Uh, all right. Now, this is another thing from, uh, you know, I, I did uh, mention that I talked to uh, Drew Harvey and the, the Dog Patch Bandit organization, asked him about safety things, what else do we talk about? And he said, you know, make sure you mention that these things are here on the East End, whether or not, you, whether or not we see them, uh, there's a problem with opiates out on the, uh, everywhere. Uh, the East End is not unique in that. And that's, that's a scary thought. Unlike alcohol, opiates actually have an antidote. That's Narcan or the Narcan Rescue Kit. They are out uh, and ubiquitous. Thankfully, EMS carry them routinely. Uh, we give them away routinely, no questions asked in the emergency department. So just something to be aware of. And again, something to be mindful of. Uh, did, um, you know, I will say that uh, uh, I was in a situation once, I won't tell you where or with who, but where there was a visitor to a friend's house who was really sick and just came over from some, just like that, it was from out of state, a uh, new friend of uh, whatever. And yeah, he looked really sick. And of course, people asked me, well, you know, what should we do? You know, what can we do to help? And yeah, could have been anything, could have had a bad gastroenteritis, but I'm, I'm convinced he was in acute heroin withdrawal, of course. I didn't say anything because there were there were there were friends and neighbors. I just suggested it's time to go to the emergency department and be checked out. But my point just being that it, that you know he was in a sense you know one of us. You just don't expect it, but it's it is there, and unfortunately, it's something to be aware of and to be there and help uh, if and when you can. So uh, heroin, fentanyl, narcotic analgesics. Unfortunately, they're there. Uh, the Narcan Rescue Kit is very, very helpful. Uh, all right, uh, this, we're coming to the end. It's four o'clock. So who's the guy on the left? Anybody have any idea? I never met him, but I'm told this is who, who, who I listen to all the time. I right, see, anybody listen to LNG? Well, I, don't, I don't know if you can consider yourself a local out here without listening to LNG, but anyway, LNG is a very old school radio, you know, broadcast radio station out of Sag Harbor. Uh, I, you know, yeah, it's an oldie station, but it's, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, it takes you back to like 1965. They, their format hasn't changed since they went on the air in 1965. Anyway, uh, this guy wasn't with him that long. That's Bill Evans as a meteorologist. And I'd love to listen to his weather reports. The guy's really good. He'll tell you what's going on and why. Uh, and with just the right amount in my mind, anyway, detail. So uh, I think this might be almost the last thing. 
So yeah, so weather apps. So if you're gonna go out on the water, if you're gonna go out on the trail, if you're gonna be out in the field, you really want to know what is going on or what might be going on. So check the weather before you go out. Whether it's a little bit of sun or a little bit of cloud doesn't make any difference. Uh, hurricanes are usually here about days in advance, thankfully, but thunderstorms can come up on you, boom, like that. And if you're out in a boat with nowhere to go, if you're way out on a golf course with nowhere to go, that's not a good thing. So in summertime, thunderstorms are everywhere. Inform yourself, make sure if thunderstorms are expected, you don't put yourself in a bad place. Uh, other apps for my phone that I use, a uh, NOAA uh, Radar Pro is good. Dark Sky uh, it will literally let you know when the rain is coming and for how long. Um, my brother and I were out doing some work in the yard and it started raining. And he said, ah, we're gonna call it a day. I said, I don't know, maybe not. Got on my phone. I said, well, I said, rain's gonna stop in 15 minutes. Let's have a cup of coffee and we'll get back to it. He goes, 15 minutes, how do you know? I said, Dr. I said, it's gonna stop in 15 minutes. He goes, yeah, right. Anyway, we had our cup of coffee. 15 minutes later, the rain stopped. We went back, did an hour's of work. So dark sky is very accurate on a hyper-local level. Windy is great for wind strength direction forecast out five days. So those are good to have. And then uh, this is the last slide, I think, right? Okay, good. Yep. So uh, listen, if, the, if this at all piques your interest, you want to do a deeper dive, there are lots of courses you can take, whether they're online or in community houses. First aid, basic CPR, AED provider, EMT, even in paramedic training. Uh, come one, come all. You'll always be welcome. Learn new skills, meet people, volunteer. It'd be a great thing. And uh, I think that's all I have to say. All right. Any questions or, or, or comments at all? Did, If you found this helpful, please let Anna know. If you didn't, or you think uh, you know, it could have been done a different way or a better way or amplified with something else, please let her know that as well. And next year when I come back, I'll, I'll try to uh, accommodate. Okay? All right, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Yep.